All right, so in chapter two, we're going to start looking at the origins of criminal behavior. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at developmental risk factors, really uh, family issues, social factors, and psychological factors as well. A couple of things to keep in mind. Um, we are looking at developmental pathways. Remember, we talked about developmental psychology in chapter one. Um, so we're looking, when we talk about developmental pathways, the life course that uh, any given human follows a particular path or trajectory, and a lot of those trajectories can be, you know, littered with multiple risk factors or a few risk factors. So we're looking at some of the risk factors in this chapter. While we look a lot at early childhood experiences, uh, it's important to keep in mind that not all criminal behavior originates in childhood, and not all adult criminals have risk factors that we can trace back to childhood. But there's pretty good correlations between these risk factors and antisocial behavior, delinquent behavior, and even adult criminal behavior. So the risk factors that we're exploring in this chapter are, again, social, family-related, psychological experiences that increase the risk that an individual will engage in, again, antisocial behavior, delinquent behavior, and unfortunately, even sometimes those behaviors will persist into adulthood in criminal behavior. So the cumulative risk model suggests that when people have multiple risk factors, that increases their risk. So the accumulation of risk factors um, increases a person's risk. Again, in other words, the more of these risk factors that are um, that are present in somebody's life in childhood, uh, the higher their risk for having trouble later on, especially if they don't have protective factors. Um, protective factors meaning, you know, good family, good parents, good, um, good community involvement. Remember we talked about being connected to something in childhood. Travis Hershey said that. So uh, if we don't have a lot of protective factors and a lot of these risk factors are present, that increases the risk. So protective factors like a good family, having connection to school, to religion, to things you're interested in, can mitigate or eliminate the negative influence of some of these risk factors that we're going to look at. The dynamic cascade model emphasizes the interaction among the risk factors and their effects. Again, the more risk factors that are present, particularly in childhood, the higher the risk of having issues with um, behavioral problems that can turn into delinquency or even adult criminal behavior. So looking at some of these social risk factors, poverty. Um, in some cities, up to 50% of children live in poverty, and there is a strong correlation of living in poverty to persistent violent crime. Poverty is often associated with diminished parental support because, uh, you know, impoverished parents might have to work more than one job, um, giving them, you know, little time to interact with their children, little time to supervise children. Um, also related to stress, poverty and stress. Again, if you are, you know, worried about feeding your family, about paying your rent, about having multiple jobs, that obviously causes a lot of stress. Uh, a lot of a lack of support, um, hard, per, uh, harsh parent, parenting, parenting styles, and even discrimination. Um, so, I, I said that 50% of children in some cities. It kind of depends on the cities, but overall, 20% of children in the United States live um, in poverty, and definitely there are cumulative effects. Uh, it's not just the poverty; it is that stress. It's the parenting. Uh, styles. It's diminished parental support. It is living in uh, dangerous neighborhoods. It's not having good schools. It's discrimination. It's a lot of other things. Not having good medical care, um, not having good nutrition. All of those are factors that contribute and can increase risk. It's not just poverty. Poverty tends to be associated with some of those things as well. Um, so again, intertwined with a large number of influences. We don't want to suggest that just living in poverty causes criminal behavior. That's not the case. There are plenty of 
people that grow up in poverty and, and never get involved in criminal behavior. But it, it does increase risk because there are a lot of other things that tend to uh, accompany pot, uh, poverty, racism, family disruption, divorce, single parenting, um, again, those dangerous neighborhoods, dangerous schools, not great schools, poor nutrition, joblessness, social isolation, um, problems with parenting, things like that. Um, so it doesn't cause chronic offending, but it increases the risk. Children from lower socioeconomic status class are targeted by law enforcement practices, um, particularly with minorities. Poor children are more likely to be formally involved with the criminal justice process where middle class and upper class children, their parents might be able to kind of mitigate um, again, I mentioned in chapter one, sometimes when young people get involved with something like a property crime or, you know, damaging property, parents pay for the damage and the case never goes in front of the criminal justice system where lower income children, their parents don't typically have that luxury of having the money to be able to do those kinds of things. Another one, peer rejection. This is a big one, um, especially early peer rejection. Uh, so peer rejection becomes, as we all probably remember, peers become more influential um, as we get a little older in childhood. Uh, one of the strongest predictors of antisocial behavior is early rejection by peers and or association with antisocial and delinquent peers. Kids that are rejected by their peers by second or third grade have a 50% chance of bad behavior as compared to only 9% of kids in those same grades who are not rejected. Um, so it is one of the strongest predictors of later involvement in antisocial behavior. Um, and also the quality of parent and child relationships and marital relationships does affect kids' behavior. And that can also lead to um, more rejection from peers. If kids that have harsh harsh parenting or they're not being monitored, that tends to lead to aggressive behaviors and bad behaviors. And those kids tend to get rejected by their peers because nobody wants to hang out with a kid who has behavioral issues. Kids that are rejected are rejected for a variety of reasons. Uh, inadequate social skills, aggressive behavior, impulsive behavior, anger, emotional rage, ADHD. These are just kids that that their behavior is kind of out of the norm for that age bracket. And so other children don't want to hang out with them. And that's why they're rejected. Um, with peer rejection and aggression, um, there was a study done in 2004. Aggressive kids who are rejected are at a higher risk for antisocial behavior than those who are not rejected. Um, there's so much... Um, there's so much research on peer rejection, especially early peer rejection. And we're talking like, you know, kindergarten through first, second, third grades. Um, those kids uh, just don't do well with their behavior. Um, it tends to get worse. Kids who are rejected tend to have impulse issues. Physically aggressive kids tend to be rejected by their peers. Kids with, again, ADHD uh, and you know, that that's attention deficit hyperactive disorder or just ADD, um, that can lead to rejection, um, especially for boys. Um, and again, it's because these kids, their behavior is different than, than what kids are used to. And so they tend to reject those kids. When it comes to gender, most research on peer rejection has focused on boys. Um, Early involvement in aggressive behavior with peers uh, tends to be, um, again, more with boys than with girls. Now, with relation, especially physical aggression, uh, relational aggression is not physical. It is kind of verbal aggression, talking behind people's back, um, talking about people. Girls tend to be higher in relational aggression. Boys tend to be higher in physical aggression. A study on boys with ADHD found that 25 boys with eight, and the study was done with 25 boys with ADHD and 25 boys who did not have it um, between the ages of six through 12. And it was a summer program. Um, and within the first day, the kids with ADHD, the boys with ADHD had more peer rejection than those, than, uh, those who did not have it. So again, just finding another link between ADHD and um, 
and rejection uh, from your peers. And that study is on page 35 in your textbook. Um, gang or deviant group influences, a direct result of association with de uh, deviant peers. Um, again, one of the um, one of the biggest predictors for antisocial and um, delinquent behavior is hanging out with delinquent peers. Um, kids that are rejected tend to seek out other kids that are rejected. Um, so antisocial peer rejected young people, kids tend to seek out other socially rejected uh, peers. And that tends to lead to groups of um, rejected kids who become antisocial, who become deviant groups. Um, Again, peer rejection and association with other delinquent peers are some of the highest risk factors that we find. Um, preschool experiences. Um, I know you probably are surprised to hear, but when we talk about early childhood experiences, we're talking about early childhood experiences, again, even uh, preschool. Um, so when it comes to preschool experiences, you know, uh, uh, there was a lot of research in developmental psychology early on that suggested kids who are put into preschool early um, don't have good attachment to their parents, and um, that leads to uh, aggressive behavior, antisocial behavior, rejection from their peers. We definitely do have more kids who are in daycare today because most parents have to work. Both parents have to work. It's you know, our, our culture is very expensive. So they've done more studies on preschool and attachment and behavioral issues. And what they found, it's low quality daycare that is related to behavioral problems. Also in daycare, kids can be exposed to other aggressive kids and they may model, remember we talked about social learning theory with Alpha Render, they can model aggressive uh, behavior that they see with other kids during preschool. When it comes to after school care, um, this is super important because the hours of between three and six, particularly for teenagers, middle schoolers and teenagers, these are the, the hours of the day when kids tend to get in most trouble because they're not being supervised and parents are at work. Um, so after school care, if if kids can be involved in high quality after school care, that's really good and it lowers those risk factors and they're less likely to get involved in uh, problematic behaviors between the ages of three and six. When kids go unsupervised or they have low quality or no supervision, um, that is related to development of antisocial behavior, hanging out with delinquent peers and getting involved in some of those problematic behaviors, especially the ones that we see between the hours of three and six. All right, another risk factor uh, is academic failure. So early school failure is associated with delinquency and antisocial behavior. Um, one study found that low retention in the early grades it can be associated with detrimental long-term effects, but holding kids back tends to lead to peer rejection. So it's, it's kind of a no-win situation. Kids that are struggling in school um, they tend to never catch up and that leads to problematic behavior. Um, but if we hold kids back to try to get them whole, you know, caught up, um, that tends to lead to peer rejection from their peers. And both of those can be problematic. Uh, really interesting studies on reading. Poor reading is related to school failure. School failure is related to later arrest and later arrest is uh, related to delinquency. That's kind of that cascade effect that we were talking about earlier. Um, labeling, you probably heard of the problems with labeling. Uh, you know, if you attach a label to a child, uh, it tends to stick. And um, particularly with school related issues. So if, if a child is labeled as, you know, you know, not being um, a good reader, not being good at verbal skills, um, being lower than normal. Those labels that get attached to that child follow that child through their public school. 
Um, teachers talk to teachers. These things get documented. Teachers read those things. So, um, you know, you can have a child that's labeled as being, you know, low in turn in certain academic areas. And then when they go to the grade the next year with a new teacher, that teacher ha already has that information. So that teacher already has kind of an idea in her head that this child is low. And, um, and it's because of that labeling. All right, parental and family risk factors may play a stronger role than a lot of other social uh, factors that uh, you'll be reading about. Um, single parent homes. In 2006, 26% 26, 26 of children lived in one parent household. Um, household. Early research suggested that kids from broken homes was associated with delinquent behavior, um, suggesting that, you know, growing up in a single family home is a strong correlation of delinquent and or criminal behavior. Later research suggests that there are other factors involved. Remember how we were talking about poverty? It's not just poverty. It's not just being in a single parent household. Other factors are uh, important as well. So the quality of the relationship with the child and the parent, of course, the parent parenting styles, the economic status um, and degree of emotional support for, provided to the child by that parent and other families, uh, other family members. So it's the process rather than the structure that play a role. Socioeconomic status, child, fam, fa child parent relationship, family support, um, children from con conflict-free single homes are less likely to get into trouble than kids from intact conflict-ridden homes. So the idea that staying together in a conflict-ridden home is going to reduce your kid's risk as opposed to divorcing or parting ways um, is false. Kids that are in good, healthy, single-parent homes do better than kids in uh, where both parents are present, but there's a lot of uh, strife and fighting um, going on. So even though it's more than one factor, research still does suggest a connection between single family uh, home and delinquency, but it's just important to uh, remember that it is not just being in a single parent um, home, it is other factors as well. Now, when it comes to parental practices, these are behaviors of patterns that uh, parents engage in. So these are strategies that are employed by parents to, um, to achieve specific goals for their children academically, socially, athletic goals, how well they're doing in school. I mean, it's across all different contexts and situations. Um, there are a lot of different parental strategies uh, that parents um, engage in, allowances, um, positive reinforcement, punishment, uh, and then there are parenting styles as well. So parenting styles, this is a really uh, a topic that has been uh, studied quite a bit in um, psychology. And these are the parent-child interactions characterized by parental attitudes toward the child and the emotional climate of the parent-child relationship. So it includes gestures, tone of voice, how, um, how punitive the parent is, how flexible the parent is. All of those things are important. Now, the most influential theory on parenting styles is Baumid's uh, Four Parenting Styles. You'll see this one cited a lot. Um, so uh, the first type is authoritarian. They try to shape and control children. They are inflexible parents. Uh, they have absolute standards. Um, it's really my way or the highway with authoritarian parents. Um, it's not considered to be the best style for children because parents aren't really flexible. Permissive. Permissive parents are tolerant. They're non-punitive. They're accepting of all behaviors. They're, they're very loving, um, but they don't have a, a lot of structure or discipline. And kids actually need structure and discipline. So this one is not a great parenting style as well. Um, I'm going to skip down to neglectful. Neglectful, these parents are detached. There's little involvement. There's no support, no supervision, no attention, uh, no physical love, no nice words. And, you know, it's, it's just being completely detached from your child. This one has the strongest risk factor for delinquent behavior. Now, in most cases, uh, developmental psychologists believe authoritative parenting style is the best style. Um, these parents are rational, rational, flexible, loving, attentive, 
um, they have reasonable social control, but and they have rules and regulations, but they're flexible about that. Um, they're also physically uh, affectionate, loving, attentive. Um, so in, in general, this is the best uh, style. Now, one thing to keep in mind about parenting styles is that every child is different and uh, it depends on what's going on in the child's life. So um, you might have a, let's say you have a child who might have some addiction issues and while trying to parent, you might need to be a little uh, more authoritarian. Uh, maybe a kid is having trouble in school. You might need to kind of lay down the law and be a little bit more authoritarian. So you might need to, you know, parenting is tricky and you might need to um, change your style a little bit for whatever's going on with your child or your child's personality. Um, the other uh, issue with parenting uh, that's kind of a newer topic in developmental psychologist is enmeshed parents. Um, you might have heard of the term helicopter parents. Um, they are, are really hovering all over their kids and really highly enmeshed in um, their child's lives. Um, and, and while that's a good thing, uh, you know, kids do need a little bit of space. So these kind of parents tend to see a large number of minor behaviors as problematic, um, and they tend to use ineffective authoritarian strategies to deal with them, and they tend to uh, not use punishment correctly. They're they're just not um, they're just way over involved and uh, a little over punitive. We talked about. Um, the permissive parenting styles and how uh, being permissive is is not a good thing. Kids need rules and regulations. So kids, parents that are lax, um, it's not a great thing. Um, kids that don't have rules and regulations or parents that are involved or show that they care or that they don't discipline their kids when they get out of line, um, it's not a great thing. So being permissive or lax is not a good parenting style. Now, the other thing that we look at with parents is monitoring. So this is similar to Baumard's theory, um, but it's looking at how how involved parents are in terms of being aware of what's going on in their child's life. Are they aware of their relationships? Are they aware of what's going on during their free time? Do they know where they are? Um, monitored young people, young, monitored kids, in other words, their parents care about where they are, what they're doing, what they're doing during their free time, who they're hanging out with, they're on top of where their kids are. Um, kids that are monitored, and again, this is having rules and regulations, are less likely to participate in drug and alcohol or engage in delinquent behavior, particularly in the school, uh, the middle school years. Um, so again, Having rules and regulations, being authoritative is considered to be the best parenting style, um, being loving and caring, flexible, rational, having rules and regulations, kind of staying on top of what your kids is, are doing without being over enmeshed and overly critical is the best style. All right, with siblings, um, kind of uh, the same one we talked about um, when we talked about young uh, people and the influence of peers. Growing up with siblings in the house, you can have uh, modeling. Remember we talked about imitation, social learning theory. So you can learn a lot of your behaviors, even delinquent, antisocial and criminal behaviors from your siblings. We also see a lot of conflict between siblings. Um, most of you who have siblings probably you know, have engaged in some type of conflict. Um, but adolescents with high rates of delinquency are also more likely to have siblings with high rates of delinquency um, uh, contributing to our idea about uh, social learning theory. Um, all right, another really important area of research in developmental psychology is attachment. Attachment has been researched in developmental psychology for well over 60 years. Attachment is the connection between a child and his or her primary caregiver, usually one or both of the parents. Um, 
the research that's been done on attachment has shown, and, and again, we've been doing this for a long time, um, has shown that there are a couple of different attachment styles. Um, if a kid has a secure attachment, and by the way, attachment takes place in the first couple of years of life. So we're talking about this relationship from birth till about three or four. Um, a secure attachment um, is what we're looking for, where the kid and the parent um, became attached to each other. There was a bond created during infancy, and that bond um, has stayed. Once that bond is in place, that really uh, helps kids develop a sense of trust for relationships. And kids with secure attachment tend to be um, teenagers with secure attachment, and they tend to be adults with secure attachment. Um, with insecure, insecure attachment, that means that there was something wrong with the bond. The bond wasn't... Um, wasn't healthy or complete during early childhood, during infancy. Um, so children, there's a couple of different types of insecure attachment. Um, children with avoidant attachment often have trouble forming uh, intimate relationships. That's friendships and adult intimate relationships. Uh, anxious, ambivalent children often become obsessive and preoccupied with relationships. Some research suggests sex offenders demonstrate avoidant attachment, and other research suggests most offenders have avoidant attachment. So there's been a lot of research um, on uh, adult criminal offending and these insecure attachment styles. Uh, these insecure attachment styles that, that develop into adulthood um, are also related to abusive relationships. So very interesting and very important uh, area of research in developmental psychology. Um, psychological risk factors, uh, lack of empathy. This is at its core um, what we find in what's called conduct disorder and antisocial personality disorder in adulthood. So there's two dimensions of empathy, um, the cognitive uh, dimension and the affective. And affect means emotion, by the way. So um, cognitive is the ability to understand another person's point of view. People that don't have the ability to feel empathy are unable to, to feel or see another person's point of view. Um, they don't have the ability to feel sympathy empathy, compassion, guilt, shame, or remorse. And those are super scary things. Um, affective, uh, the affective is emotional response and concern. And again, uh, understanding another person's emotional responses, their perspective, and an inability to feel guilt, shame, and remorse, all of those things. So uh, deficiencies in empathy considered to be characteristic of persistent, aggressive, and antisocial behavior. Um, it begins early in girls. By third grade, all kids low in empathy tend to be even lower by eighth grade. So this is something that tends to develop early in childhood and gets worse as kids get old. Um, Deficiency in effective empathy, that's the emotional empathy, appears to be most strongly related to violent and persistent criminal behavior. Lack of empathy in both children, um, in uh, children, kids associated with animal cruelty, and many studies have shown a connection between animal cruelty and violence. Um, and I see it talks about uh, psychopathy here. Psychopathy is... Um, is a behavioral pattern. It's not a clinical diagnosis. The clinical diagnosis would be antisocial personality disorder. Um, and then this behavioral pattern of psychopathy and the, the core foundation for psychopathy is a lack of empathy. So lack of empathy, sympathy, um, an inability to feel guilt, shame, and remorse, um, to feel compassion for other people. People they're just void of the ability to feel these things. Um, I talked a little bit about um, uh, early risk factors associated with school failure, and that is related to cognitive and language deficits. So we do find an increase of antisocial uh, behavior in boys that have cognitive and language deficiencies. A Swedish study that was done in 1993 found that poor language development in second grade was statistically significant predictor of adult criminal behavior. 
Another study in 2004 um, found boys with language development issues at five tended to have delinquent behavior at the age of 19. Um, so uh, one of the things associated prop, uh, particularly with language deficits, um, when people don't know how to express themselves properly with language, um, that does lead to aggression and physical responses. So you can't speak um, or communicate uh, effectively, and so you turn to aggressive behaviors, particularly physical violence. So we do see self-control and self-regulation issues, obviously uh, going to be related with academic performance, and we talked about the problems with school failure. Um, if somebody is having problems with uh, with their cognitive skills that are, interferes with their ability to problem solve um, and to um, effectively socialize and get along with other people. So those are definitely risk factors. Intelligence, so we're talking about IQ scores. Um, Travis Hershey, who we talked about uh, in the last chapter, along with Hinlong, uh, in 1977, did a study found delinquents as a group do tend to score lower on IQ test. Um, found there's an indirect relationship. Uh, low IQ tends to lead to poor performance in school, and poor performance in school tends to lead to a bad attitude about school. Remember, this is that cascade effect. So having a poor performance and a bad attitude about school tends to lead to school failure, which tends to lead to uh, both peer rejection and delinquency, and that can lead to criminal behavior later on. Um, with high IQ, there is a good performance, a, a, sorry, a correlation between high IQ and good performance and attitude about school. That tends to cascade to um, uh, internal acceptance of norms and values of culture and school. That team tends to cascade to non-delinquent behavior. So definitely a relationship uh, between IQ scores and delinquency, and by relationship, I mean correlation. Um, all right, another psychological risk factor, and I've mentioned this a few times, and that is ADHD. That is attention deficit hyperactive, hyperactivity distor uh, disorder. This is the leading psychological diagnosis for children in the United States. We actually have more cases of ADHD here in the United States than any other country in the world. Think about that for a minute. Um, so the symptoms of ADHD, inattention, so they're not able to sit and listen and they're easily distracted, impulsive behavior, um, they act before thinking, um, it's kind of one activity to the next, so they can't focus, they can't sit still, they tend to be impulsive with their behavior, excessive motor activity, again, can't sit still, they, they fidget, you can see where all of this would be problematic in a classroom. 7.8% of school-age kids have been diagnosed with ADHD, uh, mostly boys, and uh, again, it's a largely a disorder of self-control and emotional regulation, and it is uh, definitely associated with peer rejection, which we talked about how peer rejection increases risk. So boys with ADHD have an increased risk for delinquent and antisocial behaviors. Oh, before I get to that, um, there are some estimates that a quarter of all children with ADHD engage in antisocial behavior during childhood and adolescence, and even criminal behavior during adulthood. Moffat, Moffat, and Silva did a study in 1998. This was a self-report study for, with kids between the ages of five and seven who demonstrate characteristics of both ADHD and delinquent uh, behavior. And they found they have difficulty with social relationships and high probability of consistent long-term antisocial behavior into adulthood. Uh, also correlation between ADHD and high rates of substance abuse. Farrington did a study in 1991 and found violent offenders often have a history of hyperactivity, impulsivity, and attention deficit. Um, and this was done on uh, people who were incarcerated. Prevalent rates for ADHD, uh, three to 10 times higher in correction institutions, uh, meaning we find um, if we compare people in the general population to people in uh, who are incarcerated in this country, three times, three to ten times higher in incarcerated populations in terms of a diagnosis of uh, ADHD. Now, I mentioned the antisocial personality disorder a few minutes ago, um, and I said that uh, psychopathy is a behavioral pattern that we often find underneath that. Now, um, according to the American Psychiatric Association, children under the age of 18 cannot be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. 
Um, instead, they would be diagnosed with what we call conduct disorder. It is a cluster of behaviors characterized by persistent misbehavior. They have to be repetitive and persistent um, uh, in order uh, to be diagnosed with this. Um, they have those hallmarks that we were talking about um, a minute ago with the lack of empathy, um, an inability to feel guilt, shame, or remorse, no normal affect, don't understand other people's emotions and, and actually don't even care about other people's emotion. Um, this is a diagnostic label most often placed on young people appear before the juvenile courts. And unfortunately, um, there is a high correlation if a juvenile, because this is serious uh, delinquent behavior, um, if a juvenile is diagnosed with conduct disorder, um, there's a high correlation that they will go on to be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder once they turn 18. All right, OPD, oppositional defiant disorder, often diagnosed um, in conjunction with uh, conduct disorder. Uh, disruptive behavior, uh, problems with self-control, and problems with following rules from both parents and schools. Um, uh, let me say a few more things about conduct disorder that I missed. Um, uh, in terms of, in addition to all the things that I already mentioned about with lack of empathy, sympathy, guilt, shame, and remorse, all of those things that are kind of the really serious hallmarks of um, this disorder. Uh, we also see consistent and repeated other behaviors, and these are the ones that are typical. Stealing, setting fires, running away, skipping school, fighting, frequent lying, cruelty to animals, cruelty to other people. Uh, according to the DSM, that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, by the way, um, the, the behaviors have to be repetitive and persistent. Um, they do have two subtypes, childhood onset, that's before the age of 10, uh, these behaviors were were present in a child before the age of 10 and then adolescent onset, uh, meaning that these behaviors start during the teenage years. Um, now, if the onset is before age 10, the prognosis is not good. It tends to, again, these conduct disorder behaviors tend to stay all during adolescence and then move into adulthood where we would find antisocial uh, personality disorder. Um, let's see, there was a study done in 2008 that found if conduct disorder uh, was diagnosed before the age of 15, there's a strong association with increased risk of violent behavior, and that was for both males and females. Um, it's estimated that uh, anywhere between 2 and 8% of children um, would qualify for a diagnosis of conduct disorder. I already mentioned that they tend to uh, appear in the juvenile court. Anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of kids with conduct disorder will go on to be diagnosed with uh, with antisocial personality disorder once they turn 18. Um, so this is very serious when you see conduct disorder in a child. This is a big red flag. Um, by the way, uh, OPD. Um, again, this is negative, hostile, defiant behavior, and it has to be for more than six months, according to the DSM. Uh, the DSM assumes that ODD is always present with kids who are diagnosed with conduct disorder. The typical trajectory um, uh, is for lifelong offenders is severe hyperactivity and impulsivity in toddlerhood, um, being diagnosed with ODD in preschool. Um, OCD in elementary school, uh, substance abuse, high school, um, uh, conduct disorder, and then adult, uh, they would be diagnosed with um, antisocial personality disorder. So anytime you have a child that has been diagnosed with conduct disorder and OPD, this is, uh, I'm sorry, ODD, this is really, these are really serious uh, risk risk factors. These are big red flags. All right. So that is uh, everything for this chapter. There's lots of great um, resources for this chapter in, um, in D2L. So make sure you check those out. If you have any questions about anything in this chapter, let me know. Otherwise, have a great day.